I will go directly into um, welcoming our honored speaker and guest. Congressman Panetta has been very gracious to give us some of his time while he's in our local area. He's a wonderful um, asset to our representation and a great communicator. I want to thank him for all the things that he has brought forward in his um, position. Lots of experience. And um, without further ado, I would like to welcome Congressman Panetta. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Judy, uh, for that uh, brief introduction uh, so we can get right to the point. I appreciate that. Uh, and also, uh, thanks to all of you uh, for being here. Uh, on this uh, beautiful uh, Wednesday afternoon, uh, willing to come and uh, listen to me talk about what's been going on in my life for the past nine months. Uh, but I also want to thank you uh, for what you do as part of the Legal Woman Voters. Um, I commend uh, what once started off as a mighty political experiment, uh, literally has become uh, the embodiment what I believe of our democracy. And so I thank you for that. Uh, for you know, you know as well as I do, uh, we are a nation of we the people. And it's up to us, we the people, to make sure uh, that our democracy uh, not only survives, but actually uh, acts and, and runs appropriately for everybody. And so I appreciate you doing that at the local level to make sure things also work at the national level. Because we listen to you, we hear you, and that is why this is an absolute honor for me to be here. I also would like to recognize a lady who was important to me in my life, uh, my, one of my old uh, Tularcitos teachers, Darby Worth. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, you know, it, it was funny. I, I, I never had myth Miss Worth exactly for a teacher, but you always knew that she was a teacher because she was very involved with pretty much every student there at Tularcitos, and it's understandable why she continues to be so involved in our community, and so I just want to take that brief moment to recognize her for that. Um, you know, it's funny. When, when I come back in town, and, and I talk to many of you, and I talk to many people here, uh, in Washington, D.C., and the response I, excuse me, here in the, in the district, and the response I usually get is, oh, man, do I feel sorry for you to be a <laughs> freshman member here going in uh, to this, uh, with this administration. Uh, and uh, look, I, I understand that response, but I definitely don't agree with that response. Now, yes, don't get me wrong. Uh, this has been a time where it's been... Uh, a little nutty, and yes, a little overwhelming. There's no doubt about that. But uh, the fact is, is that's pretty much how I've experienced it ever since the beginning. Uh, literally the week after I was elected, I went back to Washington, D.C. for new member orientation. And it was having to get adjusted for being what it's going to be like to be a new congressman. And there are 55 of us, Republicans and Democrats, freshmen there, and just sort of getting our feet on the ground. Fortunately, I had a little head start in that sense, and I, and I knew that there was an actual underground tunnel between our offices and the Capitol, which many members did not know. So just having a heads up in that sense uh, uh, basically gave me one step ahead. Um, and then it came uh, during our swearing in on January 3rd, and dealing with the orientation, uh, getting orientated with, with how, much, how much legislation was coming at us. Uh, literally, the, the day we raised our hands and got sworn in, we were voting that day. And it's been nonstop ever since. And I would, uh, I'll go ahead and put this out there real quick. Does anybody have an idea of how many times we've actually pressed that button and voted? <laughs> 300 to 3,000, okay. Well, what about 568 times since January 3rd? That's how many times we voted. Now, not all, not all of those have been legislation. You have resolutions, you have amendments, you have rules, and so on and so forth. But I make, a, make it a point to make sure exactly what I know I'm voting on and make sure that I'm briefed on every time I press that button. And then, of course, came January 20th. And the literally the disorientation of the Trump administration. 
Uh, from his cabinet picks to his advisors' resignations. From his executive orders, including one that affected, could potentially affect the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, to an equivocation on Charlottesville, to his standing, uh, to people standing up to the Russia uh, involvement in our campaigns, to a tweet about taking a knee during our national anthem, and to threats to uh, totally annihilate an existing country, to the constant tweets. And of course, the criticism of his own party and party leadership to having Chinese food with Chuck and Nancy, as he called it. Uh, it has been a whirlwind. But I can tell you that everybody says the same thing. Uh, from being a freshman member to people who have been in Congress 40 years, Republicans and Democrats, people in government and out of government, they will all say that this time is absolutely unprecedented. They could not have prepared for this time, and they don't know what to expect as we move forward. And so as a freshman member, that kind of makes me pretty good, that I'm not alone <laughs> in feeling that way. But as you should also know that you're not alone in feeling the way you do about what's going on in Washington, D.C. And it's something that I believe that we need to work together on in order to get through. But the problem is, is that you feel that there's so much distraction going on that I do believe it takes away from the leadership that should be in Washington, D.C. And we are, I mean, you have to realize, we have a lot to do <laughs> within this year. I mean, by December 8th, we have to come to an agreement on a budget and raise the debt ceiling. We have to deal with the dreamers. We have to reauthorize the Children's Health Insurance Program. We have to now deal with the potential decertification of the Iran deal. We may have to deal with tax reform within that short amount of time. And I would like to see some progress on infrastructure as well. But unfortunately, the way there has been governing, it's been governing by flurry rather than focus. And that is an issue. Because what I've seen in the past nine months, Congress and Congress members need focus. And we're not getting that at this point. And what it feels like, as I'm sure it feels like to many of you, there's been a lot of deconstruction. There's been a lot of division. I mean, let's take last week by itself alone. Let me just go through a few things that happened last week. We withdrew from the Clean Power Plan. Our we showed our intentions to withdraw from the Clean Power Plan. We rolled back protections for transgender people. We repealed employer mandates on birth control. The administration put forward some pretty stringent immigration principles. The administration stopped cost-saving reduction subsidies and, and uh, had an executive order creating an alternative insurance plan. There was a potential for decertifying the Iran deal. There was a picture with the military advisors where the president tweeted out, this is the, or said, this is the calm before the storm. We were burying the victims of, the, of our nation's most tragic and horrific shooting in Las Vegas. We were recovering from the hurricanes in Houston and Puerto Rico, and we were dealing with our most deadly and destructive wildfire in California's history. One week, <laughs> one week, that's what's happened. But it's also been in the, in, the, in the last nine months that there has been an undermining of the last nine years of environmental protections. Since January, the administration has tried to dismantle the previous administration's rules on how we, to, so that we can lessen the blow when it comes to climate change. As I mentioned, there's been executive orders to reduce national monuments, to possibly open up marine sanctuaries, marine sanctuaries, including our own, right here in the Monterey Bay. There was the withdrawing of the Paris Climate, Paris Climate Accords in June. There was a repealing, as I mentioned, of the Clean Power Plan, a plan that, was, that was, we were supposed to reduce greenhouse, greenhouse gas emissions from American power plants by 32% by 2030. It was something where the Environmental Protection Agency director, Mr. Pruitt, said, well, the Clean Power Plan was a war on coal, is how he described it. 
I describe it as a war on our children, as a war on our future, and you feel it is a war on our democracy. Last week there was an editorial in the New York Times, and the title of that editorial was, We Used to Build Things. And Mr. Brooks went into an example of the Great Burn back in the early 1900s, massive fire, Washington, Oregon, Idaho. But from that fire came the U.S. Forest Service. And throughout our history, we have always been a government that has built things to help people. We have always advanced ideas of freedom and democracy. We have embraced people. We have embraced the huddled masses who yearn to breathe free. We embolden them to realize their power. And in return for those efforts, the world has embraced us and the world has embraced our enlightened leadership. That is what makes us exceptional. But I know that was so much distraction, with so much devastation, with so much division, and yes, attempts to deconstruct what we have built, the question can be put out there of when are we going to start building things? And when are we going to do it together? Last Friday, I attended the opening, the reopening of the Pfeiffer Canyon Bridge in Big Sur. To me, as I was standing on that bridge, seeing community members, seeing Big Sur community members as well, that, that bridge told the story of Big Sur, how resilient the people are in that area. But to me, it also told the story of what can happen when government works together in a record amount of time to get that bridge constructed. But part of me wants to realize, part of me we need to realize, is that was governing by crisis. We needed that bridge built. People came together to build that bridge, and things got done to build that bridge because it was a crisis. But it is now time, it has been past due, that our government starts governing with leadership. And I can tell you, I can tell you that there are members in Congress, new and yes, younger members, who are there willing to govern by leadership. I say that based on when I talked about new member orientation. That week after we got elected, a bunch of bright-eyed, ready-to-go Congress members, Democrats and Republicans, and we get in the room. First day we get in the room, and what happens? The leadership separates us. Democrats on one side, Republicans on the other. And for two weeks, during that orientation in Washington, we were separated. And it wasn't until our third week, where we were up at the JFK School of Government at Harvard, where we were actually able to come together. And Democrats and Republicans, we started talking to one another. We started hearing from one another. And we started building relationships with one another. So much so that uh, by the fourth day, we literally kicked leadership out of the room at one point. And we said, we want to have a frank conversation. And what, what I can tell you is that from that conversation, I heard things from Republicans that I heard from many of you, and that they were hearing from many of their constituents across the nation, and that it is time that Democrats and Republicans start building things in Congress, and more importantly, we start doing it together. Now, in Congress, I can tell you that the members there, their number one priority is my number one priority, and that's our constituents, okay? We understand that. The reason I'm standing in front of you in this position is because I was raised with a sense of what it takes to do this job. And when the number one priority is making sure that your constituents are served, the number one priority is making sure that your representatives acts as your bridge from this area, from you, the people, to the government in Washington, D.C., and back. And I can tell you that we have been doing that over the past nine months. I can tell you that we've been doing that quite a bit. So much so, let me give you a stat. Last year, uh, Sam Farr, his office received 40,000 
forms of communication into his office. Phone calls, emails, walk-ins, uh, you name it. That type of communication. Sam got 40,000. This year, we're up to 82,000 forms of communication. Now, not, not all of those are service requests and constituent cases that need to be opened up. A lot of it is, is from any of you. A lot of it is political activism, which is great. But I've told my staff, and my staff understands, that the most important thing that we can do is respond. And that's the number one priority. So the best thing that you can tell me is that, you know, Jimmy, I called your office. I emailed your office. I came into your office, and I got a response. The worst thing you can tell me is I went into your office, or I called your office, or I emailed your office, and I didn't get a response. Either way, I want to hear from you. I want to hear from you because that's my job and I will continue doing that job. And when it comes to legislation back in Washington, D.C., I know that you turn on the television and you see a lot of division, like I said. You hear about the major bills that aren't getting passed. But I can tell you that there are a lot of times when I look up on that board, and what I mean by that is if you go on into the House floor, as some of you have been, or at least up in the gallery, and you look up behind the speaker, you see all our names up on the board. And it has basically how we voted at certain times during the, the current vote. And when it's red, when you vote no, it's a red no. And when you vote yes, it's a green yes. And I can tell you there are many, many times where I've looked up on that board and seen it all green. There are many areas that we agree upon, including when it comes to supporting our, veteran, our veterans. This year alone, we've done a number of things. Republicans and Democrats, and the, the president has actually signed this legislation to help our veterans. We passed the Clear Choice Act to make it easier for veterans to get medical care. We've made it easier to hire a, a VA people, a VA employees, and deal with the employees that are trouble. We've expedited the appeal, the appeal process when it comes to not receiving your benefits and you have an appeal, we've said we're creating another line for you if you actually have evidence to present. We created the GI Forever Bill, which says that no longer are you just limited to 15 years for your GI benefits, but you can use them throughout all of your life. And myself and Republican Neil Dunn from uh, Florida, uh, we authored and put forward a bill that helps veteran-owned small businesses get priority when it comes to dealing with our government services agency. There are times where we can come together, and I can tell you when it, is, when it comes to serving our veterans, it's being done. And I also see it at times in, in the committees that I'm on. Now, for the first six months, I was on the Natural Resources Committee. That committee can be very partisan. And we're seeing it. And, there, and I can tell you there is, is a reaction on that committee to push back from the protections that were put in place for the last administration. But I can also tell you that if you work with Republicans and you have things that you want to get done, it can get done. And I say that from experience. And my first piece of legislation dealt with the Clear Creek management area in South San Benito County, an area and a bill that is open that shoot that it, pending the passage of this bill, will be open to off-road vehicles. 60,000 acres worth, including 20,000 acres on top of that 60,000, preservation as wilderness. Based on my negotiations with the chairman, Chairman Bishop, based on my discussions with Republicans, including David Valadeo, Jeff Denham, uh, and Steve Knight out in the valley, uh, that bill was able to pass unanimously out of natural resources. It was pa then passed unanimously out of the House, and we're now working with Senator Ka uh, Kamala Harris, as well as Dianne Feinstein, to hopefully put that forward in the Senate, in the appropriate committees, and get that passed and put on the President's desk. I'm also seeing it on the committee that I am on now, uh, the Armed Services Committee. Obviously, it's a great honor to be on that committee, especially coming from an area like Monterey County that has so many military installations. And it's going to be my role to let people know the treasure chest of installations that we have here so that those installations are protected. And I tell you, each time we bring someone here, each time someone gets exposed to what we have here, the response I always get is, wow, you have a lot of jewels in your district. And then I tell them, I said, but this is not just for our district. It's not just for our community security, it's for our national security. Because no longer is our military just about planes, tanks, guns. It's also about leadership. It's about figuring out the weather. It's about cybersecurity. It's about languages. Everything that we have right here in the Monterey Peninsula. 
and with our with our military installa- in, installations. And so I will make it a point to make sure that they're not only protected, but that they continue to play a part in our national security. And also, side note about the Armed Services Committee is that I am the lowest ranking member for the Democrats, okay, <laughs> of Panetta, okay. But guess what? The lowest ranking member for the Republicans, Liz Cheney, <laughs> the daughter of Dick Cheney. It's kind of ironic. It's pretty funny. Now, the other committee I'm on that I truly enjoy is the Ag Committee, the Agriculture Committee. And right now, we are working very hard to get a 2018 Farm Bill put forward onto the House floor by the end of this year. I enjoy that committee, not only from, uh, because I'm from here, because I feel I have an understanding of uh, our number one industry here, but also the people and the areas of concern for the people in agricultural industry. Um, we are dealing well with obviously putting it together, making sure that the biggest part of the Farm Bill is secured, and I'll put that out there. Does anybody know what the uh, biggest part of the Farm Bill is? Food stamps. 80% of the farm bill, last 2014, the last farm bill, 80% goes to food stamps. Yeah, supplemental nutrition assistance programs, 80%. And we need to make sure that that continues to be a part of the farm bill. And I can tell you that the minority, uh, the, the Democrats are doing everything they can to do that. And we're actually seeing uh, Republicans want that as well. Of all of them, we've had many hearings about the farm bill. And most of them have had to do with SNAP, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, so that's good. But I'm also making sure that the industry here uh, is basically continues to have the necessary funding. When it comes to our specialty crops here, we understand how lucky we are. I always say, you ask anybody on the Ag Committee where I'm from, they'll say, oh, Panetta, he's from the salad bowl of the world. <laughs> they know that, because I always say that. Uh, and so we have specialty crops. We need to make sure that they have the research for the pest and disease, but we also need to make sure that there's research for the mechanization. Um, we are dealing, as many of you know, we're dealing with a labor shortage, and we're left with a uh, labor force that is shrinking and is aging, and there's not much backfill coming in now for a number of reasons. And I believe we have to continue with what the private industry have started to do, and that's reaching out from Salinas Valley into Silicon Valley in order to produce the mechanization to replace not labor, but to replace the lack of labor that we're dealing with. And so that's another part of it. And I'm telling you that on the Act Committee, it's very bipartisan. And so much so that myself and Republican Rodney Davis from Illinois, we've created an Ag Research Caucus. We're co-chairs of it. So that we can highlight these issues for his crops in Illinois and for our crops here on the Central Coast. And I'm seeing bipartisanship on a number of caucuses that I'm on. Uh, The Climate Solutions Caucus, a purely bipartisan caucus. What I mean by that is in order to join the caucus, that caucus, you had to have a Republican join you. Same amount of Democrats as Republicans are on that caucus, purely bipartisan. And I can tell you, as a, Repo- as a Democrat, it was kind of hard to get a Republican on that caucus. My first choice was a freshman member from Jacksonville. And I approached him, I said, would you like to be on the Climate Solutions Caucus? And he said, yeah, I, th- I think I would. Uh, have your staff contact my staff. Okay, great. So I go back, I get my staff, they call him. So they call his office, and no response. Second time they called, no response. Third time they called, the staff says to my staff, eh, the congressman's not ready to join the Climate Solutions Caucus. Okay, who else is there? Scott Taylor, Norfolk, Virginia. I'd read in National Geographic, they had had they basically dry day floodings. They're dealing with the effects of rising sea levels. It's not just a community issue, it's a national security issue because in Norfolk, there's a major naval base there. I approach him, I say, Scott, you wanna be on the Climate Solutions Caucus? He says, yes, have your staff contact my, contact my staff. <laughs> So I do that one time, don't get a call back. I tell my staff, stop, let me deal with it. That night we have votes, I go onto the House floor, I see Scott, I sit down with him, we have a discussion. Scott is my Republican counterpart now on the Climate Solutions Caucus. And we're actually talking about the effects of climate change. And that's a big first step that needs to be taken, not just in Congress, obviously, but with both sides there in Washington, D.C., and we're doing that. Now, the other bipartisan caucus I'm on is called the Problem Solvers. Once again, a purely bipartisan committee. Same amount of Democrats as Republicans on that committee. And once the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, and the attempts to repeal it 
back in July, went down. Problem solvers immediately put together a working group to deal with that issue because we saw what can happen if nothing is done with the ACA. Look, we're very lucky on the Central Coast because we've seen the benefits of the ACA. Obviously, throughout our nation, 20 million people are insured. In California, 5 million people are insured. Because of the ACA, the, the uninsured rate went down from 17% to 9% in California. And on the Central Coast, the uninsured rate went from 21% to 9%. Okay? Very good things. Created 6,500 jobs here on the Central Coast. Very good things have come about from the ACA. But I also heard from you and from many other people that the ACA here has made it very expensive, unfortunately. In 2017, the Central Coast of California has had the highest rate hike for covered California, 28%. The second highest rate hike is in San Francisco County. That's at 14%. So there are issues that need to be dealt with when it comes to the ACA. But it does, I firmly believe this, it does not, and it cannot be repealed, but it can be repaired. And that's what the Problem Solvers Caucus looked at. And they came up with five solutions to do that, from looking at basically reinsurance, from making the cost-saving reduction subsidies permanent and under the purview of Congress, from looking at the employer mandate and seeing if we can expand that number. It's called compromise. We were working with Republicans on this looking at how we can uh, get rid of the medical device tax and trying to make it more flexible for states to be innovative in their implementation of the ACA, but having the, the, most, the most important guardrails of the AC, uh, ACA as well. And guess who took note of this, of those principles? Senator L Lamar Alexander and Patty Murray. Our co-chairs, Josh Gottheimer and Tom Reed, were constantly in communication with them during their hearings. The governors who came and testified, Kasich and Hickenlooper, they came and spoke with us. We had a press conference with them because they were impressed to see Democrats and Republicans coming together to work on an issue that affects many people. And I'm glad to say that as we've heard and as we've seen, despite the constant attempts to repeal it, as we heard yesterday, Lamar Alexander and Patty Murray actually came to an agreement on the cost-sharing reduction subsidies, as well as the flexibility for states to impose it. Now, I, well, that's an agreement. That's a big step, especially when it comes to that. But what you have to realize is that the ACA, is that what I've learned, is a very, very partisan issue. And I'll never forget the story I heard. I was at a bipartisan dinner on the budget where Joe Barton, a Republican member from Texas, served with my father. He'd been around that long. He said to me, he told me this story about how he wanted, he was at the ranking minority member at the time when the Republicans were in the minority of the Energy and Commerce, the committee that deals with health care. And the ranking majority member, the chairman, Henry Waxman, reached out to him before the bill was dropped and said, I want to talk to you about what we're proposing. We can come together and maybe talk about some ideas. Barton said, you bet. So they set up a meeting. It got canceled. Um. They set up a second meeting. It got canceled. They set up a third meeting. And right before that third meeting, the Democrats dropped that bill. Now, don't get me wrong. There were some amendments that took place. But the way to hear Joe Barton tell that story, the bitterness oozed out of him. You could hear it. And then just today, in talking about the... Uh, the um, the compromise that was reached by Murray and Alexander, you had Tom Cole, I read this in the paper today, Tom Cole says, in talking about whether or not they'll support such a compromise, he says, this is a Republican from Oklahoma, he says, none of our guys voted for Obamacare, they're not interested in sustaining it. It's a very partisan issue, unfortunately. But what you realize is that if those cost-saving reduction subsidies are allowed to be stopped, as the president wanted to last week, as he put forward last week, and if, the, uh, if there's this uh, independent insurance uh, associations that are allowed to uh, be propped up, as he did in his executive order last week, uh, premiums are going to go through the roof. Yes. Doctors are not going to be around. Insurance companies are going get, to get out of areas like the Central Coast. And that's going to hurt many, many people. And so that's why I felt it important to do something about it with the problem solvers. Now, look, I admit, the Democratic leadership was not doing anything when it came to the ACA. And what I mean by that is at this point, they weren't putting anything forward. And I heard from many of you, is, well, when are the Democrats going to do something to fix it? 
And I brought that up to leadership. And the leadership's response, look, wisely so, was, have you ever seen Muhammad Ali fight? The rope-a-dope? You let him get tired and fall down. And look, the Republicans have failed many times, be it the, afford the what is it called, the American Health Care Act, be it, be it the Better Care Reconciliation Act, be it the Skinny Repeal Act, be it the Graham-Cassidy Bill. They failed each of those times, thank goodness. But it, that's why I felt it was important for Democrats to come forward, work with Republicans on putting something forward. And I also felt it was important to listen to what John McCain said when he gave his speech right before he gave the thumbs down. He said things in that speech such as, our deliberations have not been overburdened by greatness due to the extreme partisanship on both sides. We aren't producing much for the American people. It appears that we are conspiring in our decline. We need to start relying on humility, cooperation, and dependence. We need to get back to regular order and get back to trusting one another. And it's okay to do something less satisfying than completely winning as long as we're pushing the ball down the field with three yards and a cloud of dust. We need to get back to that. And that is exactly what I'm trying to do with the caucuses that I'm on, with the committees that I'm on. And one of the caucuses, uh, with one of the working groups I'm on with the uh, problem solvers group is dealing with DACA, dealing with our dreamers. Now, obviously, comprehensive immigration reform is something that I believe should happen, uh, especially being the grandson of immigrants, being raised here on the central coast of California. We understand how important immigra immigrants and immigration policy is. But unfortunately, nothing has been passed on immigration since when? 1986. Ronald Reagan, Republican president, passed that. Nothing has been done since then, and that's why we're in the situation we are when it comes to immigration. But when it comes to our dreamers, and if you've met these dreamers, I mean, especially here at Hartnell College, you know how many dreamers Hartnell College has? Nearly 900. Nearly 900. Here in the Central Coast, we have 20,000. By far, California is the number one state with dreamers of 240,000. The second state is Texas with 140,000. The third state is Illinois with just 40,000. If Hartnell was a state, it'd be ranked number 39. <laughs> but you meet these dreamers. You hear what they're about. You hear the hurdles that have constantly been put up in front of them and what they're doing just to stay here, just to contribute to their family, to their friends, and give back to this community, I believe that they are American in every way but on paper. And that's why I'm fighting for them. And that's why I've decided to put together a group there with the problem solvers, Republicans and Democrats, that we can talk about how we can give them a path to citizenship and earn path to citizenship, but at the same time deal with border security. And I'm not talking, and we are not talking about a wall. We're talking about smart security, uh, detection devices, uh, aer aerostat capabilities, be it drones or more helicopter flights, other things like that, infrastructure improvement to shore up the border. Obviously, that's important to us. But at the same time, we need to understand, and Republicans need to understand, how important dreamers are to communities like here on the Central Coast. What you have to realize, though, is it may be politically easy, politically easy for me, for many of you, to say, you bet, that's important, that's a no-brainer. But the fact is, is that four-fifths of the Republicans have districts where immigrants are below the national average. I had a member of leadership, Republican leadership, in my office. This is what I'm doing, I'm reaching out to the other side to make sure that they understand how important dreamers are. And we were talking about dreamers, and he turned to me and he said, Jimmy, uh, you know, I, I, why would I give them citizenship? They're cutting in front of the line. And then I went into my story about who they are, how, they brought here, how they've been brought here, not, not on their own volition, and basically telling them about the, my time meeting with them over in Hartnell College. And his response was, Jimmy, look, in my district, I don't have to touch this issue. That's what we're up against. That's what we're up against. And so in order, because the Republicans are in the majority at this time, because it's such a pressing issue, we still have to work with them. We still have to come up with a compromise. And that's what we're trying to do on that working group that I'm on. Now look, I don't have to do that, okay? It could be real easy for me to be an average Congress member. And I say that based on during my campaign, I went back to Washington, D.C., and a member said to me, uh, Jimmy, look, 
It's easy to be an average Congress member. I said, what? Because you know what? We're damn lucky that we haven't had to experience average around here with our Congress members, the past two especially. And so, and, and so I, I asked him, I said, what do you mean? And he said, look, he said, you can go and you can do your constituent services. You can come back to Washington, D.C. You can vote the party line and just keep on doing it over and over and over. Of course, I heard that and I went back and I talked to the person I can talk to about this. I said, I talked to my father and I said, I said, I said, Dad, I said, somebody, a Congress member told me it's easy to be average. And he started laughing when I told him this. And he looked at me and he said, of course it is. Of course it is. But then he said something. He said, it's fun when you get stuff done. And that's what the job is about. And I can tell you that there are many Congress members, despite what you're hearing now, despite this sense of deconstruction that you're feeling, that there are many Congress members who want to continue to build things. They know that's their job. They know that they're there not to be average, but to be exceptional, because that is what our country demands. They understand that that takes having conversations and being able to work across party lines, despite how leadership feels, despite how some in our own party feel. It's important to do that. And I can tell you that is being done. So when I hear those comments from people saying, oh, I feel sorry for you, don't. Don't feel sorry for me. Because I can tell you, based on the people I am working with in Washington, D.C., based on the fact that I get the opportunity to serve you and the constituents of my hometown, this is hands down the best job I've ever had. Thank you. What an enthusiastic and very positive presentation that's been. Um, we're going to open it up to questions, and I'd like to have people raise their hand, and we'll, we'll try to get to as many as we possibly can. And um, please, sure. have the microphone back. But I w was wondering if uh, people from your office can go and talk to some of the veterans and some of the DACA students there, because I believe that there are some uh, decisions that are being made by the board and the administration that are working against the interests of the students who need it most, like um, DACA students, uh, students who come from uh, some of the schools that um, are not preparing them well for uh, college education, and also veterans uh, who need uh, more help than most other uh, students because many of them suffer from PTSD as well as TBI, yeah. and I work with those students. So I, I encourage you to send members of your staff to talk to those students. Well, look, as, as an uh, alumni uh, of MPC, uh, I would be more than happy to go out to MPC and talk to them. And, uh, you know, I, I, I'm remiss for not getting out there sooner. Um, but, I, but I do believe that is important. And I thank you for your work with our, our veterans who are there back taking advantage of their GI benefits. And thank you for your work with, obviously, our DREAMers. It's very important that they, both those groups, have the support that is needed. Uh, obviously, uh, both of those groups can feel uncertainty um, you know for one reason or the other at those times and so it's wonderful to have people like you there to be able to talk to them to reassure them what's going on and and that's my role as well after this I, uh, I'm going back I'm to Hartnell we're having a, a, a dreamer uh, discussion uh, after this uh, but I do believe that it would be good for me to get out there and, I, and I'd be more than happy to do that um, I think you know obviously our veterans who come back uh, you know are used to having a support system in the military and it can be very difficult having that transition uh, from military life to civilian life, especially in enduring uh, an academic schedule, a work schedule, and basically feeling that they're by themselves. Uh, that's why I was part of the uh, Veterans Transition Center before I ran. I think that's very important. Um, it's also why I felt it important as a prosecutor and seeing some veterans come through the Monterey County justice system, why I felt it necessary that Monterey County have a veterans treatment court to deal with people who, because of their service, 
can get wrapped up in the criminal justice system and they need to be treated appropriately, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it was a California state law. And unfortunately, Monterey County wasn't following that. We got involved and now they have a veterans treatment court. But I also believe with our dreamers, I think it's very important that you continue to reassure them. It is great uncertainty at this point. I couldn't imagine to feel what they are feeling. Uh, based on the uh, actions that have been taking place back in Washington, D.C. And uh, like I said, you understand what I was saying. I'm sure many of you people here do, how important they are and how, uh, how active they are in just trying their hardest to do something that I've always tried to do, give back to the community and country that gave them so much. And so I just thank you for your continued service to them, and I look forward to seeing you at MPC. So the first thank you is for being a co-sponsor for Ted Lieu's bill, H.R. 699, which would be a bill that would uh, say that they're restricting the first use of nuclear weapons and say that uh, the president cannot just... Uh, do first strike, it would have to go through Congress, and there would have to be a declaration of war. And as we see daily, that that becomes more imperative. There are 16 California co-sponsors. Thank you for being one of those. Sure. And I also want to acknowledge that you are the co-chair of the Democratic Caucus on National Security Task Force. And as such, I'm asking that you do all in your capacity to contact the Appropriations Committee, the Armed Forces Committee, to not fund programs that may lead lead to a resumption of nuclear test explosions or new nuclear weapons. The ICANN uh, International Campaign Against Nuclear Weapons just won the Nobel Peace Prize, and it's imperative that we don't begin a nuclear arms race again. So I'm asking that you do all you can to support the people in this district that do not want to see first strike, any use of nuclear weapons, and want to see diplomacy continue in our name. Thank you. Understood. Thank you, Judy. I appreciate that. And, and thank you for all your work with uh, that coalition, Veterans for Peace, as well. I appreciate what you're doing. Um, uh, yeah, no, I, I, I think, you know, after, based on the statements that have been made, uh, I think uh, Ted Lieu's bill was uh, something that we had to show support for. Uh, because uh, the way I believe that this administration, um, no, let me take that back. Let me narrow it down. The way this president uh, <laughs> is acting uh, in his words. Uh, obviously shows uh, that he doesn't understand the consequences of what he says. Exactly. And, uh, and being in that position, uh, that's tremendously important. But if this is some guy who is as um, insecure, for lack of a better word, uh, and that if he's going to play schoolyard bullying with another insecure leader, then I do believe that there need to be certain restraints on this president, and that is why I support, put my name as a co-sponsor for uh, that uh, Ted Lieu's bill. Uh, and then I will continue, uh, in the, obviously, in the Armed Services Committee uh, to look at that issue. Um, that is, I, I'll be honest with you, that is an issue. In my limited time, I've been on the Armed Services since the end of August, September, actually, uh, so one month, or just over a month. That isn't uh, an issue that has come up in the committees that I'm on, at this point, uh, oversight and tactical air and land. Uh, but hopefully, I look forward to that being a topic of discussion and being involved in that. So thank you. Our local agency is called the Safe Ag Safe Schools, SAS for short. And I'll leave with your assistant uh, some of the materials for thank that. Thank you. Because you have a, a strong voice both in the, in the county as well as in Washington, D.C. And you have the pulpit. It would be very helpful to say that these DACA children of mostly farm workers deserve a chance. Their parents are dying slowly of heart conditions, of cancers. Sometimes they're third generation California residents who are all being exposed. So anything you can do to be of help. We would be happy to assist you. Great. I'll have that information. Thank you, ma'am. I appreciate Thank that. Much. Thank you. Um, I am uh, actually uh, this week, I think on Thursday, it's uh, I, Friday. Thank you, Karina. Friday, I'm meeting with Safe Ag Safe Schools, ma'am, uh, uh, to basically talk with them further <laughs> about this issue uh, on Friday. Um, and I agree. Look, I, and I think if you talk to anybody in agriculture, I, from my experience, I think they agree, too, that you can always do better on this, you bet, 
You bet, you can always do better when it comes to protecting our children. And fortunately, because of the efforts of people like you, Safe Ag, Safe Schools, uh, I, I do believe that uh, Monterey County, uh, Santa Cruz County, and California has taken some great strides to limit uh, the pesticide application. Um, and, and, you know, if you talk to anybody throughout the nation, I mean, I, I've, I've, I went on an ag listening session in uh, uh, North Florida, and uh, let me tell you, uh, they're not talking about this at all. And so I think it's very important that we continue to talk about this and be proud that California is on the forefront of this type, these types of protections, hands down. And more importantly, Monterey County is on the forefront of these types of protections. We got, we got stalwart heroes like Juan Aranga, who went in and worked with Eric Loretzen to develop that, uh, that, that the farm worker uh, working group. Uh, and that's what has led to certain restrictions. Uh, that's what has led to certain signage. That's what has led to certain cards being handed out to our farm workers. Uh, so I do believe that there's a lot we can be proud for, on, proud about when it comes to our application of pesticides. But once again, um, you know, you know, including the restrictions of when those pesticides are sprayed. Now, obviously, they're not sprayed in the afternoon. They're not sprayed during the day. It's at night, and and there's a certain uh, barrier from schools and so on and so forth. But the fact fact is, like I said, because of people like you and the work that Safe School and Safe Ag is doing, uh, they're aware of this. And these restrictions are coming down. And, uh, and trust me, they, they understand we can always do better when it comes to that. I understand that a Democratic congressman has brought articles in, of impeachment against the president. I would like to know where you stand on mm -hmm. that. And if you don't support it, why not? Yeah, and no. what you think is going to happen. Sure. Uh, uh, th that, that is not true, ma'am. Uh, they, they have brought that up. It has not been brought to the House floor. In fact, Al Green from Texas was about to do it. But to be frank, the Democratic leadership said, don't do it. Why? Because there is not enough evidence at this point. We all know. We, it sense, we sense something went wrong. We understand that. But right now, you have two investigations going on in the House and Senate Intelligence Committees. And more importantly, I believe, I look forward to seeing the results of Bob Mueller's investigation. Because as a prosecutor, I understand that, you know, I, and nobody would want cases to be proved by just standing up and yelling. That's not our system. Our system is presenting evidence into proving someone's guilt. And at this point, we sense it, but what's the evidence? And that's what we want to see. And I believe that Robert Mueller and my work with him uh, when he was at AUSA up in San Francisco, seeing what he's done as uh, the FBI director and my personal knowledge of him, I can tell you, if there's evidence out there, he's going to get it. And when that time is right, I believe that that is when the Democratic leadership will make that move to put forward those articles. Uh, understood, but it's basically gathering that evidence to make sure that it meets the high crimes and misdemeanors uh, elements of that law. And that's what's, that's what's going on at this point. <laughs> evidence is being gathered. But in order to do it something like this, as we've seen, it's very extensive. It's very complicated. But I, I actually have faith in the process. I have faith in Bob Mueller, uh, based on his background and based on who he is, to track this stuff down. Because, look, if an article of impeachment was put forward right now, what would happen to it? And it, it nothing would happen. And, and actually, we'd actually it, it would almost harm us in the long term because we'd lose credibility. And so that's why I firmly believe, ma'am, that we need to make sure we have the proper evidence to do it before we go forward. That's, that's just that's my sense as a congressman. That's my sense as a former prosecutor who proved cases here in Monterey County. What if he fires more? What if he fires more? Uh, well, the, uh, if he does that, that's a constitutional crisis right there. I tell you that right now. Uh, there's a reason why he's been advised to not to touch that area, not to go there. Uh, you know, surprised he, he was, did it with Comey. I think that was a shock to the system. Uh, but if he does that with Mueller, I think that's a whole other ball of wax. And there will be an uproar, trust me, from people in Congress, from this, this nation, and from the people here, and there sh as there should be. What can you do and what can we do about the, the hatred and the racial prejudice that are being stirred up by our president in this country and supported by him. What can we do about it? Yeah. Look, I, I think when it comes to, um, 
you know, when, when the president um, equivocates on such things as, as the reason for Charlottesville, um, I think fortunately we saw what happened. Uh, he took a big hit on that because people like you spoke up, people like all of us spoke up uh, and basically let him know, including his own cabinet members spoke up. I mean, Gary Cohn, if you saw his reaction when he was speaking there at the Trump Tower when he equivocated from his, his I think that was his third time he had given an answer on that. Gary Cohn, a, a, a Jewish, uh, a, a person of Jewish descent, I think he was shocked absolutely dumbfounded that this is what the commander in chief would say about such an incident. And so I believe that it's making sure that we continue to speak up about that and making sure that he understands that words hurt and that especially as the president of the United States of America, uh, those translate into actual harm and can do continue to do harm. So please continue to speak up like that and we'll, we'll do our job in making sure that he knows he can't do that. Now when it comes to guns and gun control, I mean, as, as you said, look, this isn't it's just something we've experienced on a national level. It's something we experience and I experience as a prosecutor on a local level. Um, you know, I was, I was as a gang prosecutor for five and a half years in Monterey County. I saw firsthand the damage that guns can do. Um, but, you know, it's, you know it, it's funny because people ask me at the, after the horrific Las Vegas shooting, what's Congress going to do? What's Congress going to do? And I'll never forget that, because, you know, I, I would talk to people. I talked to Democrats, what, what's going to happen? And it was disheartening to see the discouragement in their voices because they've experienced this before, from Newtown to Aurora, uh, you know, it's in, to, to Fort Hood, on and on and on and on. Um, they've experienced this before. And what they do, they did a sit-in last year. And unfortunately, that didn't do any good. And so, you know, it, it's a very difficult subject to, to tackle, unfortunately, because we are not in the majority. Democrats are not in the majority. But that doesn't mean we can't continue to speak up and talk about how we should ban bump stocks, talk about how we should ban high-capacity magazines, talk about how gun violence is not just a, a community issue. I believe it is a public issue, it's a public safety issue, it's a public health issue. And why we should allow the Centers for Disease Control to do a study on gun violence. I think it's very important. I mean, once again, California leading the way, they allowed UC Davis to do that last year. I'm not sure where the status of that is. If anybody knows, please let me know. But UC Davis is now conducting a public health uh, uh, report on gun violence in California and maybe across this nation. That's something that you, I mean, what harm would that do? Why not do that? And so even though we're in the minority now, we're still going to be vocal that there needs to be something. Look, we, you know, it, I'm telling you, I, you know, I, I had to say, look, I, enough with the thoughts and prayers, to be frank. You know, I mean, seriously. I mean, the, the only thoughts, the only thoughts that we should have is how we do something. And the only prayer should be for us if we don't do something. That's where I agree. So that's how I feel. Thank you. My question here has to do with the way Republicans name things that become so catchy, <laughs> like the war on coal. Why isn't it a war on the environment or a war on people? Why aren't Democrats naming things in a way that catches people's attention? This is what I want to see. And if, if you need a committee for that, I'm on it. Yeah. That, that, I, 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 uh, I, I appreciate that question. That is, that is a very good question. One that the Democrats, ever since I got in Congress, have been asking uh, it's in, for the past nine months, but has also been acting on. I can tell you that and reassure you that. Sherry Bustos, Democrat from... Illinois, one of the only Democratic members in the suburbs of, in the rural country of Illinois. David Cicilline from Rhode Island. Hakeem Jeffries from New York, I think in the Bronx area. They have been tasked by leadership to come up with better messaging for the Democratic Party. Um, they have come up with, as we saw, uh, a better deal. Uh, but we believe that there can be work on that. And, that, and that's just something that can also transcend down, not just from a big picture, uh, but also uh, little pictures in certain issues. We do need to come up with better messaging. I completely agree with you. Uh, and I can tell you that they've heard you loud and clear, and they are continuing to work on that issue. I will Thank 
thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Thank for being you. here. Thank of course. you. Thank you. Appreciate it. That was a very, again, positive and motivating um, uh, exchange. I thank you all for coming. We thank you for your time and understand that there is a responsibility of each and every one of us in this room to take this information and process it and work with it because a representative government is only as good as the people who give them information back and forth. It's a communication both ways. So thank you again for coming and appreciate all that you do.